Thank you very much. Perfect. Easy. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, thank you, Ben, and uh, thank you, all of you, and a special thanks to Matt. By the way, you know, seeing great artists in Austin uh, it gives me goosebumps, literally, uh, and makes me just so proud to be a part of this city. I mean, how lucky are we to live here? And so, anyway, thank you very much. It was really great. I look forward to seeing the documentary myself as well. <clears throat> um, and, uh, you know, today I want to talk about something very near and dear to my heart, which is not just the two strangely correlated businesses that I'm involved in, uh, computer games and outer space, which might seem utterly divergent, uh, but to me they uh, are, are extraordinarily interrelated, and especially on the subject of creativity, because I, I believe they both inform each other and reinforce each other, and I couldn't have done one without the other, and that's sort of a little bit of the, the journey I want to take you on today. You know, for me, I was very fortunate to have a very interesting set of parents. My, uh, uh, my father was uh, a NASA astronaut, as you heard, I'm a first, second generation American to fly into space, and I flew with the first, second generation Russian. Uh, and, uh, and so that was sort of the inspiration that not only got me interested in space, but in science and technology and things of that nature in general. My mother, on the other hand, is a professional artist and uh, helped me uh, learn all different kinds of art, including, you know, silversmithing. Some people might be familiar with this little snake I've worn since I was 11. It's permanently attached. Uh, and, you know, the, the kind of artistic, uh, you know, oddities that a lot of us in Austin, you know, carry with us. And, uh, uh, and so if you look at the combination of high tech and art, I think computer games are the perfect blend of that. It is the quintessential high tech art in my mind. And I've had a career now that has spanned 30, 40 years and a variety of eras, as I now consider them, of computer games, from solo player games for the first 20 years and helped invent massively multiplayer games for another decade, and hopefully I'll be uh, helping to introduce another decade or so of, of games here coming up. But I, I go back literally to teletypes and punch cards and was writing games in those very, very earliest days. And it was, uh, and I was doing this as a hobby, really. There, were, there was no industry. There was no ability to sell and market games back when I started. Uh, but it was the owner of a computer store where I had a summer job, the guy that convinced me to put into Ziploc bags this first game that I'd made and, and uh, begin to sell them. Uh, and in, as a freshman, excuse me, as a uh, senior in high school, that first game I put in Ziploc bags sold about 30,000 copies. I made $5 a piece, and if you do that math, that's $150,000 for what took me six weeks of after school time in high school. So obviously that was a pretty good idea. Uh, in fact, I, was, I think I doubled or tripled my dad's salary as an astronaut with that first game. <laughs> and, um, and so that started the, my career in games. And, and, uh, uh, and when I was young, people, you know, my whole family would say, clearly this is the right thing to do right now, but when this windfall ends, you can go back to school, finish your degree, and get a real job. Well, of course, that's never happened. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but the Ultima series, which is what I'm still best known for, ran for about 20 years. Uh, in the solo player gaming era, and uh, uh, one of my personal credits from this is inventing, inventing the word avatar, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, as your projection into a virtual world really came out of this game series. Uh, another thing I'm credited for in the games industry is coming up with massively multiplayer online role-playing games, a giant mouthful MMORPGs, uh, that for about the last decade has been the, the, the big growth area and the most money has been made through this industry. Uh, and now I uh, have a new company, my, you know, third era. I'm building this uh, uh, new game called Shroud of the Avatar, but I'll save that for today. But I'm hoping to usher in a third era of gaming with a, a new technology that is the basis of this game. And, <clears throat> and I found through those 30 or 40 years things which I think are sort of enduring principles of the creative process. And so I, I know a lot of you are here to, to see hear about space. I'm going to get there very shortly. Uh, but, but again, because of this interrelatedness, I wanted to kind of show you some of the mining that I've gotten out of games that I think are relevant to the creative process. You know, I believe that, uh, that one of the first parts, one of the most important aspects of creativity is really knowledge of the field and material. You have to, you have to be devoted to research, devoted to exploration, and that gets us back into the space stuff, to be good at creating. I, I can't tell you how many people I've hired that I just don't think choose to be, uh, to question the reality in which we live 
as deeply as I believe I do that I think is, uh, uh, prevents them from reaching their full potential. And, and I learned it, I think, from reading Lord of the Rings, becoming a big fan of J.R.R. Tolkien, and then following his creativity back to his original sources, which I did. I've gone all the way back to the Kalevala, this oral history of the Finnish and uh, Scandinavian people, to see where he got his ideas to do his work. And, uh, and I think if you want to do great creative work, you have to devote yourself to really understanding deeply the, uh, the material in which uh, you want to innovate. And that allowed me to do things like, uh, uh, you know, around Ultima 4, I began to do games with social relevance built into them, stories that are much deeper than just fighting monsters and collecting treasure. And, uh, you know, talking about suffering for your art, you know, this was a period of time where uh, I was very touched by your comments about, you know, you're not sure if you want to put it out there because you're not sure how it's going to be received. When I was building the first game that included this, my friends, my family, my coworkers were actually all skeptical that this was the right way to go because all games are generally give people the freedom to go kill things and collect treasure and that's what they want to do to have fun. And I was writing a game that was going to take a moral stance of sorts and, uh, and force them to behave good uh, in order to win the game. And people were going like, that's, you're just, you know, you're, you're, you're treading on thin ice. But it was actually the first best-selling game I ever produced. Uh, and all my games have included things like that in the future. I've also learned things about simplifying uh, concepts to simple icons, whether they're verbal or image icons, that, so you can keep them present in your head. Like, everyone knows what a TIE fighter looks like. Everyone knows what a Death Star looks like. Everybody knows what a UFO of the 1950s looks like. And, and, and if you create uh, art that you want people to be able to remember and, and, and communicate, it has to have this simplification. Uh, I've learned things like, uh, you know, if you're going to create a reality like Tolkien did with Lord of the Rings or like I like to do in my games, the reality has to be complete. You have to know the backstories and the cultures and the languages of all of the characters and uh, uh, societies that you want to build within it. And so I, I develop a lot of that stuff very realistically now and in, with incredible detail. Um, you know, the uh, you know, the reality in which we live is very complex. If I ask you to say, tell me the big truth, capital T, of the universe in which we live, whether I'm talking about physics, chemistry, or religion, it'd be a pretty complex subject for us to discuss, and we'd probably have a lot of disagreement as to the details. But if you're creating fantasy worlds, or, or if you're trying to, you know, uh, communicate complex subjects like space, you need to simplify those down to something that people can get their head around. And I found that by creating fictions, that, that ostensibly are truthy, and truth, I'm going to use a Stephen Colbert truthiness kind of term, uh, that simplification process is, can, can actually create things that feel more true than the reality in which we live. So I began to realize I was trading very closely and dangerously in the area of creating a religion with, the, uh, with some of the things I've asserted in some of the games that I've done. So now let's move from games. Those are some of the concepts that I pulled out of, of 30 years of gaming. But what's, what has inspired and kind of been this parallel process for me is my passion for exploration. And space has always been the, 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 the kind of the, the big goal for me through these explorations. But I was very fascinated in exploring the rest of the world. And through my, in, you know, taking money that I've earned in games and chosen to invest in both personal exploration as well as opening frontiers for exploration, well, I've, I've met up with a group of people who have opened, like if you want to go down to the deep sea, you, uh, the only place you can charter deep submersibles is through one of my companies, uh, Deep Ocean Expeditions. If you want to go to the middle of Antarctica, you have to use uh, Adventure Networks International, it's the only company you can use. If you want to go to space, you have to use my company, Space Adventures, there's really no other option. And so we literally built a sequence of companies that can take people truly to the, uh, all of the extremes, poles, space, deep, the sea floor. But here's how that sort of happened. I mean, you know, we, we, a lot of us, or at least some older than most of you in the room, and, uh, but I grew up uh, obviously during the Apollo era, and the, the, what was cool about the 60s and 70s was the inspiration that represented to you know, not only STEM education in general, uh, but people's belief that space was possible and we were all going to go live there very, very shortly. But strangely that, you know, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 went by, you know, with, uh, and we're, we're, we're now a decade past and we're still nowhere near uh, coming up with, uh, with that kind of vision of the future. But there were a lot of us who grew up in that era that were, that kind of still had it as an assumption that it was going to come true. And that was more true for me than probably most people because I, not only was my dad an astronaut who I obviously lived with, 
But my right-hand neighbor, Joe Engel, left-hand neighbor, uh, uh, Hoot Gibson, also astronauts, over the back fence, another astronaut. Uh, you know, all the famous other early astronauts were my neighbors in the neighborhood. And so I just grew up believing everybody went to space because <laughs> everybody I knew did. But sadly, it was a doctor, uh, one of the NASA doctors, who told me that because I had bad eyesight, I was no longer eligible to be a NASA astronaut. And he didn't realize at that moment that he was crushing my dreams. Uh, he just thought, you know, almost uh, very few people are eligible to be astronauts, and uh, so I'm just giving you the facts as it is. Uh, but at that point, I said, you're just telling me that I'm no longer eligible to be a member of the club that my parents and my neighbors and everyone in my neighborhood is part of, and you've just kicked me out. And so at the age of about 13, I said, well, you know, if I can't go with NASA, I'm going to have to invent my own space agency. And at the age of 13, that doesn't sound that hard. Uh, but as you can imagine, that's really hard. Uh, but my, with my earliest successes in computer games, I began to funnel money towards that dream. But the first attempts, frankly, did not work. And, but why they didn't work and creatively how you manage out of it was, I think, is a very interesting issue. The first people who I began to partner with to try to pull off that dream were the people who I knew around me. A lot, a lot of NASA astronauts or SCUB contractors who they themselves were often frustrated at the slow pace of the opening of space. And when they would retire or leave, like my dad, he would come up to me and say, hey, Richard, you got a bunch of money in your bank account. Why don't you and I go build the, these, like one of them was uh, an extended duration orbiter pallet for the space shuttle so they could put a double-decker bus in the back of the payload bay and take passengers. And I was like, all right, my chance to go. And so I began to fund some of these early things to find out that, you know what, convincing NASA to change their plans, con convincing the government to change their plans, forget it. In addition, you know, all these astronauts and scientists that I was investing and in, backing and partnering with early on, those guys were hired because they were great scientists or because they were great military test pilots. They were not hired because they were great entrepreneurs or great, uh, you know, government, uh, you know, uh, uh, p politicians to move the government in some major way. And so reflecting on it, I'm going like, well, of course that couldn't work. I mean, it was really completely the wrong plan with completely the wrong people, though I tried it five or six times. And one of the biggest lessons was if something doesn't work and you know why, and so you can actually pick up a plan that is now improved from that one, then it's probably worth trying again if it's still you know, compelling and important to you, which this particular dream was for me. And that's when I began to slowly build the connections that I had that started opening up all these other extreme places, the deep sea and Antarctica and uh, these sorts of areas. And it was that group of us who all were interested in going to these extremes and we all had the vision for space, began to put together a sequence of, of, of companies and organizations. And uh, one that I was not part of, but uh, one of our other members, a guy named Peter Dumanis, started the Students for Exploration and Development of Space. He then also started something called the uh, International Space University. Then together we started something called the X Prize. We put together a $10 million prize for the first private vehicle that would fly twice into space in two weeks, which was one in 2004. At the same time, we started Space Adventures, because Space Adventures was selling tickets for people to ride on those vehicles to go to space, and without proving there was a market, nobody would invest money in the creation of those vehicles. And so we had to really do both at the same time. And interestingly, as we were doing that, we got tired, frankly, of waiting for suborbital vehicles to come into existence, which are still constantly two years away. I think it's still about two years away. Uh, and so we decided to skip all that and go all the way to orbit. And uh, we said, well, you know, there's only two ways to get to orbit today. Uh, you know, there's either the space shuttle or there's the Russian Soyuz. And so we went back to NASA and, and the Russians and said, hey, how'd you like to lease us some space on your vehicle? And the United States said, thank you, but no. And we went to Russia, who said, thank you, but no, because to find out if it would be possible, how much it would cost, how we would train you, et cetera, would cost us a lot of money to give you an intelligent answer which we took as a qualified yes. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, so I put up the money, which was about 300 grand, I think, to have them go do that research to see if they would do it. Uh, we, they, they eventually gave us a yes. I actually, at that time, had just sold my first game company, Origin, to Electronic Arts. I had the money in my pocket to become the very first person ever to travel into space, and that's when the internet stock market crashed. And literally completely wiped me out, literally dead zero. And uh, so suddenly I had to sell that first seat to a guy named Dennis Tito. I had to uh, uh, start over from scratch, really, rebuilt a whole other company, sold another company. And then as soon as I had the money, boy, I took that trip to space. <laughs> and so it was uh, in October of 2008 is, is when I managed to pull it off and uh, 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 you know, basically uh, uh, put myself back in the poorhouse again by taking all that money and funneling into this effort. Um, but what's interesting is even with that effort, I wasn't 
just there for a joyride. I mean, I've, I've been, this is not something that I just had a bunch of money in my pocket and said, what am I gonna do with this money? And you know, threw it away on a, on a trip to space. I've been building all this for 30 years. And so with my trip to space, I wasn't also just about to go up there and just to hang out. I actually had a, took on a very heavy load of commercial um, and uh, uh, other activities, both to offset the terrible ticket price, uh, but as well as to try to find businesses to do in space that would take me there again and again and again, because this isn't just a, a one-off for me. And it's interesting to see how this has evolved. For example, uh, you know, in the previous era of the shuttle, um, you know, space travel is very expensive. It's very dangerous. And you add those two things together, and it means it's very rare. And in fact, I would argue that there's very little we're doing in manned space flight today, or over the last decade, that frankly is worth the high cost and the high risk. It's actually, I've, I've seen all the experiments that are being done in space, and it's actually a pretty hard thing to justify well, in my mind, as much of an enthusiast as I am. But the great news is, is that because of this commercialization activity that we started, frankly, to get ourselves into space, but it's now all of the entire industry, from every government on Earth and all this private activity, are now swinging the needle radically in the other direction. And so, for example, if you, if you look at any other form of transportation other than rockets, cars, boats, planes, and trains, all four of those, if you're going to own it and operate it yourself, it costs you about three times as much as the energy cost to own it. In other words, to pay for it, the depreciation of the vehicle, to repair it, to insure it, about three times as much as the gas. But conversely, rockets cost about 100 times more than the gas. And the reason why is, is because imagine if when you went to fill up your car at the gas pump, you crushed it and bought another one, <laughs> and then filled it up with gas. No, none of us would drive much, right? So, and that's what we do with rockets right now, is we basically crush them, throw them away, and build another one. So no surprise. But the energy cost, I mean, people, it's, it's, people don't realize, like, that for, if you wanted to buy an entire Russian Soyuz, they'd charge about $200 million to, to let you do whatever you want with it. Um, but the fuel that goes into it only costs about $800,000. So, you know, one two hundredth of the price is the fuel. And if, you did the, if, the, if the vehicle was reusable and you do that same multiply by three, it would only cost $3 million to send three people. That'd be $1 million a person. And that's what's interesting that's really happening right now. If you look at, for example, SpaceX, which has already docked with the, the station three times, uh, they now, um, uh, there's not reusable yet, but they're already bringing the price down from today, it's about 50 million for the Russians, it'll be, it'll be about 20 million a seat probably with the uh, Dragon. And his version two actually lands under power right where it took off. And so therefore it will be 100% reusable. Nothing is wasted on that vehicle. You just restack it, refuel it, and go again. And he believes he can get that price down under $1 million per seat. And even though that's still more than most of us have in our pocket as change, I earned more than a million dollars, I earned you know, a handful of millions of dollars on my tens of millions of dollar trip. But as that price comes down under, you know, into single digit millions, I bet there's a lot of us who could think of things to do that would be worth multiples over that ticket cost to go do. So as long as you're willing to go work while you're up there in space and not you know, just pay for it out of your pocket, I think basically anyone is going to be able to take themselves to space here within the next decade. And, and so here's how a little bit that's going to, I think, going to uh, unfold. Uh, here's those vehicles that are still two years away. Probably will be for another few years, I expect. Uh, that uh, there's a whole fleet of suborbital vehicles that are going to be able to take you straight up to 100 kilometers and then fall back down, uh, you know, to the Earth, at giving you about six minutes of time in space, which is not much, but it'll only cost you tens of thousands versus millions of dollars. One of the things you'll be able to do from that is space diving is one of the things I'm looking forward to. And uh, uh, if my wife, I got married two years ago, so my plans for this are now having to be modified a little. <laughs> And, uh, but uh, you, know, you know, you saw the Red Bull guy, Baumgartner, you know, did this wimpy little stratospheric jump. You know, now we'll be able to go much, much higher. Um, then, uh, you know, you do, when, once you get up to orbit, and that's the places where the companies like SpaceX, uh, you know, need to take us, uh, there's a whole fleet of new vehicles, some being built by governments or sponsored by the government, some being built completely independently. Uh, these are the things that we think are going to get down to the, you know, one million-ish. You know, Elon thinks you can get it below, like, but even if it's two or three million, which would be a pretty darn good target compared to 200 million. Um, you know, we've got the International Space Station up there now as a giant asset if you want to go hang out and either have a space hotel or do some research. And once the price comes down, I think that's a much more reasonable thing for us to go pursue. 
But there's also a, a hotel mogul out of Las Vegas, a guy named Bob Bigelow, who's already flown two uh, inflatable station segments up into space. And they've all been, uh, neither one are big enough to be occupied, but they prove out the whole technology and he's ready to go. He's just now waiting for a place to put it. And so he's literally on ice waiting just for the vehicles now to catch up, the new boosters and things uh, to catch up to him before he launches these private things in space, which may be much cheaper to stay in space than on board the ISS. And then if you're looking for things to do, you know, like just as an example of some of the things I did, uh, you know, um, uh, with these other extreme trips that I take, like down to the hydrothermal vents and down to the ice in Antarctica, um, you know, you've all heard the old Boy Scout adage of, you know, take nothing but pictures, leave nothing but footprints. Well, with my dad, I learned an extra one, a third one, which is don't forget to bring back scientific samples. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so, uh, you know, I've taken my dad on a number of these extreme trips, and we always take a big doer of liquid nitrogen bubbling away and a bunch of sterile bags and things. And at hydrothermal vents in, in Antarctica, we always brought back microbes uh, from around those vents, and we take them back to universities. Universities gene sequence them and find unique proteins, and those are actually all marketable. Uh, so we have a company that sells these proteins we've uncovered on our vacations. Uh, and, um, uh, and additionally, it turns out if you are going to do something called protein crystal growth, which is again another good medical application, uh, if you grow crystals in zero G, they grow much better than they do in a gravity environment. I could explain why, but it takes a while. Uh, but I do that also as a business now, and I've, that experiment has flown three times now after my flight. Uh, there's a company here in town that, uh, uh, that now is doing vaccine development in space. I could describe that in detail if somebody wants to know why that's important. Uh, there's people talking a lot about space-based solar power, and uh, uh, Japan actually has a plan to put up a giant solar factory to beam down a city's worth of power into Japan, uh, but frankly, I think that is difficult because it requires more mass and more assembly in space than has ever been done in history by a long shot, but there's another way to do it which is another, the same group of us that built all these extreme companies. We have a few more now working. One is called Planetary Power. It is, uh, its goal is to put up a single launch space-based solar power generator and just beam it uh, directionally to anybody that needs a much smaller amount of power, but it can all be done in, with one launch, no assembly in space. But that way, for example, the most dangerous energy, most expensive and dangerous energy on Earth is in military forward bases. And so if you could just beam them power, they wouldn't have to truck all the fuel in and out, which is the most dangerous job in the military right now is being on the convoys of fuel, which we could eliminate with one launch. And we're already building this hardware. We're already deploying this hardware right now. Uh, the first one's uh, up, and, up and running in Hawaii, up at one of the big telescopes up on the mountaintops. Uh, and this is proving the technology that will ultimately be launched into space with these single launch pieces and, and beam back. Uh, we have another company called Planetary Resources, which is going off to mine asteroids, which has made a lot of the, that one's made the news a lot recently, so you may have heard of that one. Uh, we've, uh, we, in fact, we just did a Kickstarter to take the first telescope that's going to do these surveys to look for the right ones to go mine. Uh, we raised a few million dollars on Kickstarter just to build a few of these telescopes that'll go up there and people can, you know, send their picture up into space as well as a little thank you for, uh, uh, being a part of it, but uh, once you find those asteroids, and by the way, there's gazillions of asteroids up there, including, uh, you know, not only the ones that are very far away, not only the ones that just zip past Earth, but there's some that linger near Earth uh, that are probably, that take very little energy to go get, and some of them are probably made out of things like platinum, and you know, you grab refrigerator chunks of platinum and throw it back down on the Earth, most of it will burn up, but then you get bowling balls of platinum, and it's mighty valuable. And so, uh, uh, Here's some examples of some of these that kind of linger nearby the Earth. But even if you don't want to do an asteroid mining, then there's things like uh, planetary defense. Now, you know, I expect you all saw in the news where this one uh, meter recently came in over Russia and you know, made these big booms. And we're all familiar with the once every 200 million years or so, there's an extinction event, often due to a mega asteroid that comes in. Well, interestingly, there's an asteroid coming here in a 2029, uh, I think, yes, uh, called Apophis. And you can see how close Apophis is going to come to the Earth. It's going to come well inside the, 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 the radius of the orbit of the moon. Uh, it is, uh, it, it, there was a period of time where they weren't sure if it was going to hit the Earth. They've now actually calculated close enough to where they're confident now that on this first pass, it won't hit the Earth. But they're not as confident on the second pass. And so on the second pass, which uh, in 2036 is going to come much closer again, uh, even closer than that first time, and they've already started predicting the potential places it will hit. And this, by the way, is at least big enough to destroy a city. 
And so, uh, uh, so thinking, you know, getting us out into space to start doing some things like this, you know, if, if we ever calculate that one of these is going to hit the Earth, you can bet there'll be plenty of investment money available to, uh, you know, to go try to stop it. Um, then after that, so, so that's all the stuff you can do just right nearby. That's the stuff that we're, we're building the vehicles right now that we can pull that off with. Uh, after that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably start building bases uh, on uh, nearby moons. And then finally, uh, I think about 30 years from now, I think we finally will reach out and start pushing humanity back onto other planets. Uh, already, Dennis Tito, the guy that bought that first ticket from me and became the first civilian in space under his own uh, recognizance, uh, he is funding the next trip to Mars. He's literally put up hundreds of millions of his own money, and he's not going to go himself. He's letting people sign up, and he's going to have a competition for who gets to go right on it. But uh, there's a window in a few years that's coming up where the alignment of the planets is just right, and so we've got to take advantage of it now, and no government is going to move fast enough to pull it off, so he decided, I'm going to fund it myself. And so uh, the next trip, the next interplanetary trip is likely to be this trip funded privately. And, uh, and, and I'm a big believer in you know, ultimately making humanity a multi-planet species. Uh, I think Mars colonization is something we can do within about 30 years, and I'm one of the believers of that you don't even have to do it two ways. It could be one way. Who would go one way? Who would go to Mars and just be one of the first homesteaders? There's at least one volunteer. <laughs> There's two of us. So, uh, and, 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 and what I find interesting about that is that you know, people are going like, oh, nobody would do that. And actually, this is, that's the fewest people I've ever had answer that question uh, positively. Uh, and, uh, but you, know, you don't need that many volunteers because there's not, the not going to be that much room on the rocket. So uh, we, don't, we don't need very many of us. There's be plenty of room if it's just the two of us. So. <laughs> and, uh, but I believe that just like uh, you know, Stephen Hawking, who we've taken on our zero-G plane, uh, where you know, he, he, he asserts that humanity must become a multi-planet species or frankly we will face extinction. You know, and whether it's in the short term do some st stupid thing that we do as a race or as a species um, or whether it's uh, you know, a, a Apophis that you know, hits the earth uh, or, or the sun eventually you know, dying a few billion years from now, uh, we will ultimately have to become an interplanetary species. And again, you know, we've accomplished all that through this process of analysis and perseverance and creative uh, solution pro uh, problem solving. And that has created, for example, my little company, Space Adventures, it, of, of the 50 space agencies or so on Earth, we're now the sixth largest and, uh, by the number of people we've flown. And we've, uh, we've got uh, two, three more people already in the queue who will be flying here in the next couple of years. Uh, and then we'll, we'll move up a notch to being the fifth largest space agency on Earth. And so uh, uh, this wave of privatization, I think, is, is nothing new. It's now, it's the wave of the future that if any of you actually want to go live or work in space, I, I think that door has now been opened and I think it's a safe thing to, to plan on, uh, you know, without regard to your age, without regard to your vocation. Uh, I think that uh, those opportunities are now finally open for all of us. So thanks.